Hello, this is the first video for metabolism and endocrinology. Uh, this will be a series of three videos that will introduce the important topics you need to understand before we launch into discussion of individual endocrine glands. Uh, here we're going to look at just the general definition of endocrinology, uh, look at uh, what uh, I'm calling here the inner terrain, so look at how the endocrine system really is one of the main regulators of our inner environment. And that's going to be very important for not just understanding the endocrine system, but also uh, when we begin to look at pathology of different conditions, even organ processes are very dependent on the endocrine system. So I'm going to talk a bit about this concept of inner terrain. In the next part of the video, we'll look at the endocrine system in general, look at glands and uh, the different types of hormones, um, look at hormone receptors, how hormones are, are transported in the blood and metabolized and so forth, and then uh, explore a little bit about the hypothalamus and how that's important for regulating the endocrine system. And then we'll look finally at at um, just very generally endocrine disorders and how naturopathic endocrinology is uh, similar and yet a little bit different from conventional endocrinology and look at some of those differences and um, look at how we can apply the concept of the therapeutic order in understanding endocrine conditions. So as you most likely know by now, endocrinology is a branch of medicine uh, that deals specifically with the endocrine system and it's all of its disorders um, and uh, the specific secretions, which are the hormones of the endocrine system. Um, now, as I mentioned just now, the endocrine system is extremely important. In fact, one of the primary regulators of our inner environment. So if we look at what actually regulates the metabolism of cells, uh, for example, metabolism of hepatocytes, liver cells, or renal cells, and how they detox, and etc., um, that is actually highly regulated by the endocrine system. Um, what regulates tissue growth and proliferation and differentiation is also under the uh, regulation of the endocrine system, sleep, digestion, respiration, cardiovascular function, renal reproductive function, body weight, body mass, and even uh, the uh, effects on the brain and the effects on our inner emotional life and even our thinking life. So we might say the endocrine system also has an influence on the psyche. And I'll, so I'll say a little bit more about that here in just a bit. Um, of course, an endocrinologist is a specialist in endocrine disorders. Um, these are um, basically specialists in internal medicine or pediatrics, so they go through medical school. They do usually three years of internal medicine or pediatrics uh, residency, and then typically they do two years of fellowship after the residency training. Uh, and then there's a board certification through the American Board of Internal Medicine or the American Osteopathic Board of Internal Medicine uh, in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. There is currently no um, specialty certification for naturopathic physicians in endocrinology, but as you most likely know, a lot of naturopaths deal a lot with endocrine conditions, even though they aren't considered specialists per se in that. Um, now, what's the significance? Why do I make such a big deal about the endocrine system here? Well, of course, this is a course in endocrinology, so that's part of it. But the significance is that really the endocrine system is the prime regulator of your metabolic activities and your inner life activities. So we can say, what is it that really uh, organizes your life activities? That is the endocrine system. There's a very ancient concept, which I'll touch on here coming up, and that is the idea of the vis medicatrix naturae, the inner healing forces of nature. And if we were to really put that in a modern language, in a modern context, we'd have to say that what regulates the vis medicatrix what carries the activities of the vis medicatrix is the endocrine system. Now, as we'll see, the nervous system and the immune system uh, also play in with that. So we can talk about the neuroendocrine immune system as the prime regulator of our inner terrain and our inner, inner physiology. Uh, the organ systems like the heart, the lungs, liver, kidney, and so forth, um, of course, also regulate our inner environment. But we can say they, in turn, are regulated by the neuroendocrine immune system. So the different neurotransmitters, cytokines, as well as um, the uh, hormones, all regulate organ function. And when I say nervous system, you know, we usually think of the central nervous system, but importantly for regulation of organ activity, it's the autonomic nervous system, uh, which plays the greatest role. So we're going to say a lot about this concept of neuroendocrine immunology because as naturopathic physicians in particular, we can argue what a naturopath really does 
is uh, to support the neuroendocrine immune system and thereby support uh, normal physiology. So that's a little bit different than uh, the typical approaches to medicine, which I'll touch on here as we go. Now I want to really develop this concept of inner terrain because I think that's going to be important as we go forward in understanding the different hormones. Uh, and I want to kind of jump back in history a little bit and just look at how uh, this concept of our inner environment, uh, inner physiologic environment, was uh, conceived of in more traditional medicines. Um, if we go back to the Hippocratic Galenic Islamic medicine, so that's essentially the ancient Greek medicine, which was further developed uh, in Roman times and then was further developed uh, by Islamic physicians. Um, we call this Hippocratic Galenic Islamic medicine. In fact, there's still a modern version of this. It's called Unani. So Unani medicine is the uh, sort of remnants of this uh, type of medicine, and it's still practiced in um, uh, uh, Persia, um, throughout Iran, um, and uh, even in India, there are schools for it as well. Um, you know, the emphasis in ancient thinking was not so much on substances like hormones or chemicals or neurotransmitters and so forth, but more on elemental processes. And uh, so we, they spoke of, for example, the earth process, solidification, water, which is more the dissolving tendency, air, more movement, volatilization, and then fire, warming, and transformation. Um, you know, today we don't speak of these same processes in chemistry, although interestingly, if we look at the four primary elements of life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, we can argue that the carbon process in nature really is all about solidification. It's about creating structure, the carbon backbones of organic molecules. Uh, if we look at diamonds and the inorganic world, hardest substance there. Um, so carbon we can think of as an earth carrier of this earth activity uh, versus water. Uh, oxygen is actually highest in water. Um, so H2O by molecular weight is mostly uh, oxygen. Uh, the atmosphere, which we usually think of with oxygen, is only 20% oxygen. Uh, it's mostly nitrogen. Um, but water we can think of as more this oxygen process. And of course, oxygen is involved uh, both in a helpful way, um, being something that is able to uh, donate or grab electrons um, in maintaining life processes. It, all, of course, also can have an oxidative effect, which can be inimical to life. Um, and then nitrogen, again, we can think of that as our major air element. We see nitrogen in alkaloids in the plant kingdom. We see it in proteins, and of course, proteins are what gives us the ability to move, essentially. It's our muscles are all protein. Our neurotransmitters are derived mostly from amino acids. They move our thoughts, move our nerve activities, and so forth. If we look at inorganic nitrogen compounds, they're all about movement. Uh, nitroglycerin, these different things, are very explosive. Um, they have this great capacity for this volatility. Uh, versus hydrogen, we can think of fats, lipids, so forth. Saturated with hydrogen, this is a warmth process. Hydrogen carries in a uh, hydrogen compounds carry an enormous amount of inner warmth. Uh, again, fats are an example. If we think of methane uh, as a gas and so forth. So all of these, these four basic elements of life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, really are a modern, you can say a modern interpretation of this older way of thinking, which again, wasn't so much based on the actual quantifying the substances, but on the qualities and their activities. Now in living beings, it was perceived that these elemental processes became living humors that these uh, earth, water, air, and fire elemental processes were imbued with vital forces. These were perceived of, interestingly, as not coming from the earth, but from the cosmos. Uh, so the planetary activity, the stellar activity, all of this uh, was seen as imbuing the dead mineral elements with living activity. And this is where the concept of the vital forces originated from. Um, the humors, in turn, maintain our inner terrain our growth, our reproduction repair, and uh, collectively they comprise what I had just mentioned, the vis medicatrix naturae, these, the uh, healing forces of nature. Um, and the proportion of these different humors within one's physiology uh, determines essentially one's temperament. So we can think of a person with a lot of the fire elements, um, when the fire element becomes a living humor, it becomes what they call the yellow bile. And the yellow bile, if you had a lot of this activity, you had what's called the choleric temperament, very fiery temperament. Uh, versus the air element, which was associated with light also and with movement, 
um, this was actually seen as carried by the blood. So um, the blood element uh, gives rise to what they refer to as the sanguine temperament. Um, very airy kind of uh, temperament. Uh, versus uh, a lot of the water process, this gives rise to phlegm. And uh, this gives this is the basis of the phlegmatic temperament. Uh, and then a lot of that earth process, that slip, that tendency towards mineralization, solidification, gives rise to black bile. And the black bile um, is the basis of the melancholic temperament. So not important to really know those at this point, but just understand that this was the conception that we were uh, essentially as human beings composed on a physiologic level of these four active forces, and they had to be maintained in balance. And it was perceived that disease itself was actually a result of an imbalance of these inner life processes, um, and that germs, toxins, and so forth, although they were recognized to a degree, were seen as being secondary to the inner terrain. And I'll come back to that concept because that I think is very important even today. Um, eucrasia is a balanced state of the humors, um, and that was a state of health, versus dyscrasia would be an imbalance of the humors, uh, and so forth. Um, in the, uh, essentially, when the terrain is imbalanced, then the individual is susceptible to those outer infections or the effects of stress and so forth. And so it's perceived that the role of the physician was to really balance the humors, restore eucrasia, and support the humors and the organ processes. Um, this type of medicine is known as humoral medicine, and this is important to know because uh, many of our traditional medicines today, for example, traditional or classical Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, Unani, as I mentioned, Tibetan medicine, many, many others, uh, the, it's a very long list, uh, and then even classical naturopathy in the European nature cure movements are considered to be humoral medicines, very different than our uh, sort of mechanistic uh, materialist medicines today. It was seeing that these inner forces, which again were imbued with life activities, maintain an inner terrain. If you keep that terrain healthy, then a person is less susceptible to outer influences. So keep that thought in mind. So that's just a very brief review of the different types of humoral medicines. I'm not going to go into Chinese medicine or anything like that, but again, the fundamental conception was all similar. Now, I think it's very important to understand that um, the humors and the physiologic terrain, this was seen as the activities that maintain our life activities. Uh, and this was referred to by Aristotle and others as the vegetative soul. So the vegetative soul, almost like a plant, is what keeps us alive. Um, it's in contrast to our physical body, which was perceived as being more mineral. In fact, when a person dies and you're left with a corpse, then you're left with essentially the physical body. The vegetative soul is no longer there. Those activities have all uh, died out. Um, it's a long discussion about the life activities in the body. We now know the role of water in maintaining those um, cells we can think of as essentially little bags of jelly and that jelly is actually electrically charged. There's all sorts of interesting properties now we know about water in biological systems. In fact, many, like Gerald Pollack, bioengineer up at the University of Washington, has written several books about this, um, talks about the fourth phase of water and how when uh, water lines up around hydrophilic surfaces like proteins, it starts to take on a whole different function. In fact, it organizes itself in different structures and it can carry information and energy. It's what we call neg entropic. It actually opposes the forces of entropy. This is what the ancients, I think, were talking about when they meant the life activities. Um, now, importantly, it was seen that on top of those life activities, we have also a psyche, or what Aristotle referred to as the animal soul. And um, this is really the basis of our emotional feeling self. So it wasn't just that we thought in ancient times there were a bunch of humors. We also understood the role of the psyche, uh, person's emotional life, and how that can actually influence the humors, how that can change the humors. And then even on top of that, there was recognized a human individuality. We can think of the psyche as being the basis of our consciousness but the spiritual forces as the basis of our self-consciousness. So today we might not use the word spirit in all circles, but we can talk about what we might say thinking or noetic forces. Um, these in turn organize the psyche so we can peer into our emotional life, we can actually act differently from our emotions uh, and so forth. 
and then uh, those in turn can influence your life activities and even the physical activities. So if we look at how the life activities play out, they're constantly, for example, bone, the most solid part of you, is constantly being dissolved and redeposited. So we can say you're going from a mineral physical state back into a fluidic state, which is imbued with those life activities and then back to the physical. So that's a constant process going back and forth. Uh, that in turn, again, is influenced by the psyche and then by these higher spiritual forces. So there's really what we might call a fourfold model of the human being. And that's going to be important because although I make a big emphasis on the endocrine system, we can say the endocrine system really is the basis of the life activities. Uh, we, of course, have the nervous system, which plays out with the psyche. So the neuroendocrine system really is, the, the uh, in modern language, the interface between the psyche and the life activities. Similarly, we can think of the immune system as really being the differentiation between self or individuality and non-self. Um, and we can think of the immune system as working through warmth processes, fever, inflammation, that sort of thing. And that's really, that was perceived of in ancient times as an image of the spiritual forces working through warmth um, that are able to grab into the psyche, reorganizing the nerve activity, and then into the endocrine activity. And there's a lot, of course, research going on looking at how our thoughts, our emotions can influence our life activities, our hormones and specifically, and then vice versa, how our hormonal life and our metabolic activities like the gut flora all influence the nervous system in these higher forces. So we have to really think of this as a much more fluid system than just, okay, there's only one aspect to it. Um, all right, so that's uh, that's a little image of the fourfold human being, which I'll kind of be touching on uh, as we go here. I'll say one more thing, and that is um, uh, going back to inflammation. We often hear of inflammation as a bad thing, how we want to stop inflammation and so forth. But again, we have to really be clear that there's two types of inflammation. There's acute inflammation, which actually, if it's allowed to do its job, um, has a healing purpose. So if you have an infection, the fever you get is actually a good thing. You want to encourage that so that the immune system can do its work. Um, similarly, inflammation after you sprain an ankle or uh, get a wound uh, is all part of the cleanup process to redissolve the tissue and then prepare it to be reintegrated uh, into the body. Um, so acute inflammation has a good role. It's chronic inflammation, which can be a problem. We can think of chronic inflammation as acute inflammation that essentially got stuck. So usually acute inflammation is followed by repair, tissue repair. Um, but with chronic inflammation, you get inflammation, tissue repair going on at the same time. So curiously, uh, one of the old perceptions of this was that to heal the chronic inflammation, you actually have to induce an acute inflammation um, to clean up the mess. And that's part of what I'll be touching on as we go here, a method known as salutogenesis. Salutogenesis means to support the, the healthy forces of physiology. Uh, so in this case, supporting inflammation to do its job versus suppressing inflammation um, because you think it might be harming the body. So we'll have to talk about those differences as we go. But um, that's where in the ancient times, at least this inflammatory process, fevers and so forth, were actually seen as having a salutogenic or healing role that we should try to support as best we can. So up until really the 1700s or so, um, most physicians in the West really thought, still thought in terms of the humors and vital forces. Uh, but increasingly science began to, actually the word science wasn't really coined until the 1800s, but what we would call natural philosophy or medicine, uh, began to look more and more at substances, began to quantify things. And increasingly, there arose this idea that maybe we don't need vital forces to explain life activities. Maybe we can just use the laws of physics and chemistry, which are evolving, to, to understand life. Um, so there's a lot more emphasis going on uh, looking at substances specifically. And really, in, in the late 1700s, we have uh, individuals like Lavoisier in France who really founded chemistry, who began to emphasize more and more uh, quantifying, measuring, looking at substances, they were not as interested in these sort of elemental processes. So air in the ancient conception was now perceived of as actually com being comprised of many different types of gases. So we have oxygen, carbon dioxide, and so forth. Um, so instead of looking at the activities of air, it was more like what's in it. And that was sort of the, uh, the real drive. Um, so this, this rift began to, to 
uh, arise between some physicians who really held on to those old vitalistic ideas and then others who argued that really mechanical forces, again, physics and chemistry was enough to explain life. And that was the vitalism mechanism uh, debate. Uh, and one interesting character was uh, Friedrich Wohler. Wohler was an organic chemist. And Wohler is known for actually having devised an experiment. So uh, up until Wohler's time, uh, physicians and, and scientists thought that, um, you know, to have an organic compound like urea or a protein or fat or something like that, um, you needed a living system, uh, a living organism with vital forces to make that compound. Uh, but what Wohler did is he actually took an inorganic compound, ammonium cyanate, heated up in a test tube, and he got urea, which was an organic compound found in urine. And so people thought, oh, well, we don't need a living organism anymore to make an organic compound. So many historians kind of look back to that moment in 1828 when Wohler did this experiment as sort of the first nail in the coffin of vitalism. And that uh, nail was driven deeper and deeper as more and more was understood about enzymes and biochemistry, we began to elucidate all these different chemical pathways and more and more an organism was just seen as a chemical being, um, not so much something imbued with vital cosmic forces and so forth. Um, then around the 1850s, really the idea of the cell as being the center of life came into four. And it was Rudolf Virchow who proposed the cellular theory of pathology that disease didn't arise from an imbalance in the humors, but rather in cells. And so we need to look at cells and how they work uh, to really understand uh, uh, disease, but also life. And that's, of course, where medicine has gone ever since. We've begun to look more and more at cells. So even today, you go to a medical conference, we talk all about the cells and the cellular machinery and the receptors on the cell surfaces, and the nucleus, and the genes, and so forth. So we have a cell-centric view today, and that really started in the 1850s. A um, little bit later, Pasteur, Robert Koch, and many others really began to look more and more at microbes, bacteria first, and then later viruses, uh, and parasites, and so forth, began to realize that there are these distinct entities um, that cause disease, and um, that if you uh, were able to kill these entities, then the organism could begin to flourish again. So we begin to look at what stresses the cells, a microbe, maybe toxins, things like that. Um, now, interestingly, around the late 1800s, early 1900s, this is when classical naturopathy uh, really arose. And this was really, many have argued, was a counter reaction to the emerging medical paradigm what the naturopaths argue, and they were this, is, this wasn't unique to naturopathy, there are many in the conventional scientific realms who also argue this, they argue that really it's the terrain, the soil, the conditions in which the microbes and so forth grew that was more important than the microbe itself. Um, and um, so Benedict Lust, Henry Lindlar and whatnot all talked about ideas and principles to maintain the inner terrain, the inner soil, uh, to make a person less susceptible uh, to all those different microbes. And I'll talk about one individual here in a little bit, Antoine Béchamp, who was actually a, a conventional microbiologist, um, very well recognized in France for his work. Um, he was sort of a rival of Pasteur, and uh, he argued the same thing, that it was really the soil, not the bug, that creates the illness. And uh, the story goes, we think it's a myth, but it's an interesting one, um, that Pasteur on his deathbed, his final words were, Béchamp was right, the soil is everything, the bug is nothing, and he dies. Uh, but of course, we have our conventional thinking that it's really still the bug uh, that creates the problems. So naturopathy, interesting, arose as an anti-bug school <laughs> and uh, its original conception. What's interesting today is naturopaths, a lot of them focus on bugs, and uh, they actually use a more conventional language to describe killing the bugs or these different things, which is in a way anti-naturopathic from the original founding um, uh, sources. But I think that's something we need to maybe think of um, in, in the light of history. Okay, so that's a little bit about how vitalism began to shift more towards mechanism, understanding that not humors, but cells, and then microbes, toxin, physical things caused illness in the body. And so medicine really went down the track of isolating, quantifying those things uh, ever more clearly. Now, interestingly, while all that was going on in medicine, you had uh, Virchow, we had Pasteur and Koch and so forth, 
there was uh, another trend, and that was in physiology, uh, where physiologists like Claude Bernard really began to look at, okay, well, cells are good, but what integrates all the cells into a whole? What are the forces that maintain the uh, sort of integrity of an organism in the face of changing external conditions? And uh, so there was more and more uh, attention paid to what uh, uh, Bernard talked about is the milieu interior or the inner environment. Um, and uh, it was seen that the cell really was dependent on the conditions in the extracellular matrix. Um, and that what happens in the ECM, the extracellular matrix, actually determines largely what happens in the cell. And so this was uh, the beginning of Bernard's work here in physiology. He really ex he founded the science of experimental physiology using methods we'd consider very controversial today. Did a lot of experiments on animals, usually living, uh, which we would not do today. Um, but he discovered a lot of things like the glycogenic function of the liver, the role of the pancreas in digestion, looked at the mechanisms of temperature regulation, um, studied the action of different drugs like curare, carbon monoxide, and then looked at the role of the vagus nerve in regulating cardiac function. And then in 1858, he really developed this idea of the milieu anterior. Now, why I think this is really important for naturopaths in particular is that, again, naturopathy, classical naturopathy, was founded more in the humoral medicine thinking. We have this concept of the vis medicatrix. Today, if you talk to a conventional physician uh, using that language, many of them will dismiss you. And uh, if you go on to Google, go online, type in naturopathic medicine, it's a bunch of pseudoscience, it's a bunch of nonsense. We still believe in the vis medicatrix, which was disproved by medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's interesting is that the vis medicatrix concept actually never left medicine. It was simply renamed. And that's what I think a lot of people need to understand. We don't talk a lot about this, uh, but I think it's very important. Um, Charles Robin was a physician that actually developed this idea of milieu anterior to begin with. And he actually used it as a synonym for the Hippocratic humors in the vis medicatrix. So what Bernard, the founding father of experimental physiology came up with, with the milieu anterior, essentially was a renaming of the humoral medicine and the vis medicatrix. The difference, of course, was that Bernard was looking more at physical things, different hormones, nerve activity, and so forth, um, versus these generic humors. But the idea fundamentally was the same, that there has to be an inner balance of these forces to maintain good health. Um, so he was a little bit more interested in the physical mechanisms, but again, similar, the, the overall idea was very similar. Um, Bernard was famous for saying that the stability of the inner environment is a condition for the free and independent life. Uh, it was Walter Bradford Cannon, who then later, American physiologist, um, really coined the word homeostasis to describe this inner environment. And Cannon in particular did a lot of work with the fight or flight response, the role of the sympathetic nervous system in that. And he's the first one to describe the negative and positive feedback cycles that we talk a lot about in endocrinology. Um, and he began to realize more and more that the neuroendocrine system really was the regulator of the milieu anterior um, and the inner life activity. So we went from talking about the humors and vis medicatrix up to a point where now we talk about homeostasis and the neuroendocrine system. So we never really threw out the vis medicatrix concept, concept. It's just been renamed. And I think for naturopaths going into the later, you know, here we go in the 21st century, it's important that we begin to understand that and begin to use that language uh, more and more. Hans Selye was another endocrinologist, Hungarian, wrote a very popular book called The Stress of Life in the late 50s. And he's the one who coined this word general adaptation syndrome as a way that organisms respond to stress. And in particular, he worked out the role of the HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, in regulating the stress response. So all the things we talk about with cortisol and the stress response really started with Selye's work um, in the 1950s. And uh, so we'll be coming back to that and specifically the general adaptation syndrome because this applies to a lot of the patients that we see in the clinic and uh, we have a lot of therapies that we can use to support them uh, through that. So we now know a lot more about hormones and the nervous system and neurotransmitters. There's been a lot of work that's that's gone into elucidating that over the last hundred years. Um, 
there was, you know, after Bernard, the uh, there was still a school of physicians who continued to work with the milieu anterior, and specifically that we're looking at the extracellular matrix as a foundation for life. Uh, a couple of uh, notable individuals here was, was uh, Hans Eppinger um, and Alfred Pischinger. Pischinger, actually, there's a couple of his books we have in the li NUNM library, which are quite uh, interesting to read. Um, they looked at specifically the nature of the proteoglycans and so forth in the extracellular matrix how they essentially can store water, can store energy, electrical charge, um, and how cells, so that's depicted here in this picture to the right, these are cells, how the cells really to get nutrition from the blood, uh, the nutrition, oxygen, so forth, has to diffuse through the ECM, through these different structures, um, and then waste products have to go the other way, back to the capillary beds or out through the lymph channels. And then we, of course, have autonomic nerves, which regulate that as well. So really, it's the ECM, which is, uh, in their view, in Pischinger's view, for example, was really the center of the life activity, not the cell. Um, and um, so if we look, again, at what really is regulating those water structures and so forth in the ECM, we now know it's the endocrine system together with the nervous system. So the hormones coming in from the circulation, they're influencing these water structures out here, making them either more gel-like, which makes it more difficult to detox, or more liquid-like, which makes it more easy to detox, uh, and they go back and forth. Uh, in this particular diagram, they're depicting little deposits of toxins and so forth in the ECM, which could uh, impair cell function. So again, a lot of these humoral type medicines, classical naturopathy and so forth, we can argue really are more extracellular based medicines versus cellular based medicines. They take the cells into consideration as well, uh, but they're looking more at the conditions outside the cell uh, for maintaining health of the cell function. Um, Related to that is what's called pleomorphic theory, which I'll just mention here briefly. This is not a history course, so I don't want to go into this in too much detail. Um, this comes out of microbiology, and this was going back to that idea that it's the soil that really is more important than the bug. In particular, it was noticed by, again, many microbiologists like Antoine Béchamp, uh, Gunter Enderlin, Albert Calmet, uh, Gaston de Sans, uh, Royal Reif, uh, and so forth, that these, uh, that the same microorganisms in different tissues with different pH, oxygen levels, and so forth, um, actually assume different forms. And so this started a school known as the pleomorphic theory in microbiology, that the same organism in different tissue conditions actually becomes different morphologically, but also biochemically. Um, so that was uh, in opposition to the theory we've all learned in microbiology, which is the monomorphic theory, that there's a single bug for a single disease. If you get the bug, you get enough of it, um, you're going to get sick from it and you have to heal from that and so forth. Um, so the pleomorph has argued it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, this was largely dismissed, although interestingly, if you look at some of the most recent literature, there's still... Uh, a lot of research going on around pleomorphism. Different organisms, a good example is H. pylori, actually assumes different subtypes depending, again, on the tissue conditions in which it exists, which explains a lot why, although 80% of the people in the world are infected with H. pylori, not all of them get peptic ulcers and so forth. And uh, this is because we also have to look at the tissue conditions. If they have high cortisol, if they have thyroid dysregulation, sex hormone dysregulation, insulin resistance, this all changes the way that the H. pylori is functioning. So again, here I'm trying to make the point that even with immune uh, uh, activities like infection, the endocrine system plays a tremendously important role. Finally, I'll say one uh, final area is in cancer research. So in our current thinking of cancer, we have, most of us have learned the so-called somatic mutation theory, and that is that uh, cancer cells are cells that have defective genes. Um, they have these proto-oncogenes, which have mutated into oncogenes, usually because of some stressor on the cell, toxin, radiation, and so forth. Um, and then those oncogenes are pro-growth genes, so they cause the cell to grow. And so the big search in uh, cancer biology, of course, is what are those genes? How do we target them? How do we target their proteins that they make and so on and so forth? Um, that's somatic mutation theory. 
Um, interestingly, there is a counter theory to this called tissue organization field theory. And what they argue in this school is that actually it's not the genes, it's the cytoplasm in the cells, which is very dependent on the extracellular terrain. Um, and they've done some very interesting experiments in this realm, looking at, for example, taking a cancer cell with a nucleus filled with mutated genes. Uh, and most cancer cells don't have one or two gene mutations, they have thousands. In fact, most cancer cells, if you look at their uh, chromosomes, they're broken, they have different pieces, they don't have the classic 46 chromosomes. Um, and uh, if you take a nucleus from a cancer cell, pluck it out and put it into a cytoplasm of a healthy cell, interestingly, the nucleus heals. The uh, the, the, the chromosomes actually heal, they stop expressing the abnormal proteins, the pro-growth proteins, and the cell reverts back to a normal cell. On the other hand, if you take a healthy nucleus from a non-cancer cell, put it into a um, cell where you plucked out, a cancer cell where you plucked out the nucleus and it has the unhealthy cytoplasm, put the healthy nucleus in there, it reverts into a cancer cell. Um, so this is a really a big challenge to the somatic mutation theory. Um, so again, if we look at what are the forces that maintain the cytoplasm as well as the extracellular terrain, it has to do with the endocrine system. And so hormones play an enormously important role in that as well. All right, so that's just a little bit about how we can begin to look at the endocrine system as helping to regulate our inner terrain and looking at how important that terrain concept is and how it's connected with the old traditional concepts of the humerus and the vis medicatrix. Okay, so I'm sure you've all learned about homeostasis by now. Um, and uh, this, of course, is defined as a state of steady internal, physical, and chemical conditions uh, maintained by living systems. It's really a condition for optimal functioning of the organism. Uh, it requires that a lot of variables like body temperature, fluid balance, pH, electrolytes, glucose, and, and so forth are all held within a relatively narrow range. Um, this is important because, you know, people are low on iron. You think, oh, they just need more iron in their system. You put more iron in, hmm, their iron is not going up. That's interesting. And that's because a lot, all of these different uh, minerals, uh, electrolytes, even vitamins are maintained by homeostatic mechanisms and just pushing more in doesn't always correct the problem. So in the case of iron, a lot of times low androgens could be a real problem uh, or low thyroid in people in picking up that iron and utilizing it appropriately. So that's where, again, we can look at the conditions that regulate the terrain for that. Um, now, a lot of variables are not static in time. So like body temperature, it's highest actually, there's a 24 hour rhythm, it's lowest in the evening hours, early morning, and then it begins to rise during the day. So you see a circadian or 24 hour rhythm on body temperature. Um, so it's this whole static temperature, 98.6. We know that, first of all, most of us are much colder than that, uh, and that's normal, but also the temperature varies within a 24-hour period. Um, more and more, and I think with better technology, we'll be able to say that this curve on temperature over 24 hours, uh, it, if it's disturbed, if, for example, you get a temperature curve that looks like this, that that itself, although your average temperature might still be 98.6 or whatever it might be, um, the curve being disrupted is a sign of illness. And uh, there are some technologies that are beginning to pick that up and utilize that for temperature rhythms. We're also seeing that for a lot of other variables. So I think as technology develops, we're gonna to begin to see that it's not just the level of a substance like a hormone in the blood, it's whether or not it actually has a healthy 24 hour rhythm that's really important. Uh, and if that rhythm is disturbed, even though the hormone levels might be adequate, it actually could be an indicator of illness. Um, so that's why it's gonna get very complicated when we look at things like hormone supplementation. If you're low, just taking someone up on hormones isn't always the best thing because you also need to uh, understand the rhythm of those hormones. Cortisol, thyroid, etc., all have 24 hour rhythms that you have to think about. Um, Generally, these rhythms are, again, 24 hours. That's called a circadian. Some of them are less than 24 hours. That's called ultradian, or some are more, like the menstrual cycle over a month. That's an infradian rhythm. And so those are more nuanced rhythms. Interestingly, going back to the old concept, I said that in the ancient Greek idea, the vital forces were connected with cosmic forces, specifically planetary forces. 
and the rhythms of the planets. Curiously, we're beginning to see that a lot of endocrine rhythms actually are related to the same rhythms we see in the planetary system. So for example, uh, if you look at Jupiter, it actually has a 12 year cycle, 12 year orbit around the sun. Um, and we interestingly think that uh, a lot of the hypothalamic hormones actually have a 12 year rhythm to it as well. So um, that's kind of curious. We don't have a lot of conventional research looking at that, but of course we have a whole field of chronobiology and now more specifically chronoendocrinology, which is looking at these connections. Um, now homeostatic systems require a sensor that could be a cell receptor, that could be a nerve ending, that could be a baroreceptor, stretch receptor, um, a control center, uh, big ones in the brain being the brainstem and the hypothalamus, uh, and then an effector, and that's usually in the nervous system through autonomic efferent nerves, but it could also be through a gland secretion into the blood. Um, and these uh, homeostatic systems are regulated through feedback systems. So the biggest one being negative feedback, as for example, temperature goes up, there are mechanisms that kick into place to actually cause more heat to be vented to the surface to try to lower uh, body temperature and so forth. So that's negative feedback um, versus positive feedback, which is less common, but that's for example, during labor, stretch of the cervix, but also the uterus um, and uterine contractions get amplified. So as they start to contract, you get more and more and more contraction, that's positive feedback. We'll see in the endocrine system, it's mostly negative feedback uh, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and then again, the primary systems which regulate the uh, homeostasis would be the nervous system, uh, and that would be through the central nervous system, but also through, and that's brain and spinal cord, but also through all of the different autonomic nerves and so forth. And the hypothalamus is a major regulating organ here. Uh, and then the immune system, all your lymphatic tissues, and that would include your uh, innate and adaptive immunity. Cytokines are our main um, signaling molecule here together to some degree with the prostaglandins. And then our endocrine system, which is what we're gonna focus on, and that really includes both your exocrine and glands. So like the pancreas secretes glands, uh, uh, hormones from inside the pancreas to a surface, to a mucosal surface. That's an exocrine gland, that would be your digestive enzymes, versus endocrine, the hormone goes straight into the blood, and then it travels around the body and interacts with different, uh, different uh, tissues. Um, so those are the three primary systems, and then I mentioned before that organ systems like the lung, liver, kidney, heart also maintain homeostasis, but they are, in a way, regulated by these three primary systems. So in a way, we should really start with the neuroendocrine immune system in our training in medical school first, and then look at the organ system secondly. Uh, but usually it's the other way around. Um, just before I move on here, I want to say that here is a uh, circadian control of cortisol. We're going to look at this in a lot of detail, but notice that cortisol has a spike around dawn. That's called the cortisol awakening response. That's what gets you out of bed. And then it should go down. And then by midnight, it should be down at the lowest levels. And then it should start rising up again. So that is a normal 24 hour cortisol rhythm. So if you take an average, you get an average cortisol level there. Now, again, this will be important for hormone testing. If you test at 9 a.m., you're gonna get a different reading that at you know, 6 p.m. Um, so we have to take that into consideration. Um, now we do know, and this is going to be a very important concept with, uh, cortisol, and this applies to other hormones as well, that we might see a curve that looks something like this, where you don't, don't really get a large awakening response. And then you get another spike here and it goes down and then something like that. If you average it, it's still the same, but unfortunately it's at the wrong time. And this is what a lot of people, just to introduce this concept now, refer to as adrenal fatigue. It has nothing to do with the adrenals not secreting enough hormone. There, there are situations when that's the case. In fact, biomedically, we have a serious condition called Addison's disease, where your adrenals don't put out enough cortisol and mineral corticoids, um, and then that can actually be fatal. Um, but for most people, stress, they get a curve that looks like this. So their total cortisol in 24 hours is normal, uh, but the timing is off, and that is uh, dysregulation. In fact, we call that HPA axis dysregulation. That's the technical name. We shouldn't use the word adrenal fatigue unless you're talking about Addison's disease. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that because conventional endocrinology doesn't look at that as much. That's not important. They look at Addison's or the opposite is Cushing's. You have too much cortisol. 
Um, but we as naturopaths also, we look at those two, and we have to always be aware of those, but we also look, and this is going to be more common in our patients, at this dysregulation. And there's a lot we can do with uh, diet, exercise, lifestyle, herbal medicines, acupuncture, etc., uh, to re help people re-regulate that rhythm. And, um, and that's going to improve their stress response, their immune response, everything else. All right, so that's just a little brief intro to endocrine rhythms, which we're going to be touching on more and more as we go. Now, one final concept here is uh, the term allostasis. Now, allostasis is really maintaining homeostasis through change. So the classical definition of homeostasis is very static. Your temperature is always around the set point, your glucose around the set point. But if you go and start living in the desert, you're going to have to change your set point on temperature a bit. Um, and the organism has to adapt. It has to be flexible to adapting those set points. And that's what the concept of allostasis uh, really takes into consideration. So it's a process through which organisms actively adjust to both predictable and unpredictable events. Uh, and this was proposed in the 80s by Sterling and Ayer as a sort of next incarnation of homeostasis. Um, now that change, so external stressors, for example, um, you're going to have to adapt to those, and that stressor is known as allostatic load. Um, so really, a state of health is one in which you can manage an allostatic load, and where that load doesn't really push you over the top. The allostatic load always is going to cause some wear and tear in the system. Um, so if it's, you get overly stressed, then that leads to pathology. Now, some critics of this uh, model have argued, really, it's just homeostasis in a different language. Uh, but the important concept here is that we're not just static fixed. We always have adjusting endpoints, and uh, these have to adjust in the face of uh, uh, external conditions all the time. And uh, the, uh, your ability to actually resist and, and maintain that environment um, in the face of those external conditions is really what leads to health. And when those, uh, when the allostatic load becomes too much, we begin to see pathology and disease. And that's really, again, another incarnation of the humoral medicine idea, that it's not the stressor, the bug, the toxin that makes you sick. It's how well your body's able to adjust to that and deal with it. And um, that's, I think, an uh, area of medicine we have not emphasized as much. We tend to focus a lot on removing the external stressor, the food, the toxin, the bug, uh, kill it, get rid of it, and so forth, versus how do we create a more robust inner system to resist that? And that's what I'm going to really emphasize throughout this course, is how the endocrine system, uh, we can think of it as the one of the main systems for maintaining that inner uh, resilience. Okay, so that's a little introduction on inner terrain. Um, make sure you understand those different concepts because we're going to be building on them uh, throughout the rest of this term. In the next video, I'm going to look more specifically at the details uh, of the endocrine system.